Now a conversation on religion, ethics, and the news media. Diane Winston, the Knight Chair in Media and Religion at the USC Annenberg School, compares civil society and the media in the Reagan era to today. This is about an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Maureen. Thank you to Robert Franklin. Thanks to the Department of Religion, to Bill and Maggie Brockman of the Hall of Missions, to Tom Hagen and his family, and to all of you for joining us again for this fourth in the series of these uh, interfaith lecture series here in the Hall of Philosophy. I'm especially pleased that Diane Winston, who holds the Knight Chair in Media and Religion at USC's Annenberg School, uh, is here with us. I don't know how many of you know about journalism education, but to hold a Knight Chair, that's, uh, that's like the Nobel Prize in journalism education, so we're really glad that, that uh, Diane is here. I will say a little bit more about her in just a moment and her topic, but I'll spend just a moment, as I traditionally do, setting this up of this discussion series we're having in the afternoon and how it fits into the rest of the programming we're having this week. An underlying theme we've been having, a background uh, presence for all the discussions in the amphitheater, here in the Hall of Philosophy and panel discussions, has been how the news business and civic society can do its part, the news business do its part, to give us the information and the values and the perspective we need as a democratic society to find our way. And I was thinking of that this morning during Nancy Gibbs's very interesting conversation with David Vandrelli. I assume many of you were there to hear that as well. So, we can... so I'm going to have a brief, a brief quiz based on this discussion. This will be the audience parts. You live streamers, you can raise your hand at home. So uh, they were talking about the difficulty of having accurate information come across and holding its way against uh, fake information, which has been a very important theme of all of our discussions this week. And of course, this comes in the news with Confederate statues, which obviously are the center of controversy now. Um, I will, I probably won't ask for a show of hands, but I'll do an imaginary show of hands of when we think these Confederate statues mainly went up. Do we think they went up in the 1850s as the Civil War was coming near? Do we think it was the 1860s during the Civil War, 1870s and 80s for Reconstruction? No, as you probably all know. The two main periods of their construction were 1910 through 1920, the same period that the Klan was getting going in Indiana and other places in the West, and in the early 1960s. Who here has driven to National Airport in DC along Jeff Davis Highway? Any guess on when that got that name? 1922. Who has been on the avenues in Alexandria, Virginia? All the north-south avenues in Alexandria are named by law for Confederate military leaders. The east-west ones are for cultural leaders, but the north-south ones are Confederate uh, military leaders. When did the law come into effect requiring that? 1963. Anything else going on in 1963 that might have, uh, I mean, it is, so this is a way in which we think of these Confederate uh, statues as part of the timeless heritage of the country, but actually they were part of an invented history at certain times of national and, and Southern uh, life. So this is just by way of context saying that the, all the platforms in Chautauqua this week and all of our discussions at two o'clock in this afternoon have been about the ways in which our institutional life, formal governing institutions, informal civic society, individuals in their ethics and religion, religious organizations, and the media can together try to restore the elements of, of civic life that democracies depend on to, to uh, uh, continue. And those elements include tolerance, which is under strain now, a willingness to compromise, also under strain now, and a shared reality base in knowing what is going on. If all those threes uh, are, are eroded, uh, we are in trouble. We've heard that theme explored in various ways in the amphitheater, as you all have listened, and we've heard it on the stage with Michael Gerson, Peter Beinart, Gustav Niebuhr, and now Diane Winston. And I predict, knowing, having an idea of what her speech is going to be about, I predict you will find this a very interesting, stimulating, and concerted argument about how we got to this point in our national history what it means and what we can, can do about it. Um, Diane Winston is excellently prepared to have this kind of discussion and that she is both, she has been a practitioner and she has been a scholar and she is now preparing the next generation of people to be practitioners and scholars. Uh, 
For more than a decade, she was a working uh, newspaper reporter, working for the Raleigh News and Observer, Dallas Times Herald, and the Baltimore Sun, has contributed to many other newspapers. She was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for her work in all three of those places, Raleigh, Dallas, and Baltimore. And she now regularly contributes to other uh, newspapers and magazines. But also, she has a PhD in religion from Princeton and has masters from Harvard Divinity School, Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, and Brandeis. And in her position as night chair at the Annenberg School in USC, her focus has been on this intersection of religious and religion and politics and culture and the news media at the local and the national and the international levels, uh, teaching courses such as Hollywood, Faith, and the Media. But she's well positioned in LA to be, to be doing that. So um, I'm, I could say a lot more about Diane, but I, I don't want to use up too much of her time. I'll simply say that as our discussions have evolved on the way news organizations, governmental culture, popular culture, and all the rest can either uh, defend us or not defend us against the challenges of this era. I think Diane Winston has a very good perspective on how we got here and where we might go from here. Please join me in welcoming Diane Winston. Thank you. Okay, can everyone hear me? Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Bill and Maggie Brockman. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. And thank you all for coming out today. I have to tell you, this is a dream come true for me. When I began researching my first book on the Salvation Army, I learned that the early leaders of the Army, who were incidentally women, would come to Chautauqua to talk about faith-based social service delivery. And from reading their remarks, I had the feeling that this was a place to go when you wanted to have enlightened conversations about how to better the world. And so to be here today among you and to have a chance to talk about issues that I think are so important is just, as I said, a dream come true. And it's so much of a dream that I want to tell you all, my new best friends, that today is my 26th anniversary and I am here with you, and my husband is in LA. <laughs> and he was fully supportive because he knew how much this means to me. So if you see me later, give me a pat on the back or a hug and tell me that, you know, after 26 years, I didn't do the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, so, a minister and a politician wind up in front of the pearly gates and St. Peter comes by to show them their new digs. They start walking and they stop in front of a humble little abode. And St. Peter turns to the minister and said, this, my son, is for you. Thank you, thank you, St. Peter. Well, the politician begins to get a little nervous because if the man of God got that humble abode, what was in store for him? They keep walking and they come across a beautiful green expanse and in the distance are rolling hills and flowers and a beautiful mansion. And as they get closer, St. Peter turns to the politician and says, and this, my son, is for you. Well, the politician is, is gobsmacked. How did I get this? So he turns to St. Peter and says, well, I'm not quite sure I understand. Why did that holy man of God get a shack and I'm getting all this? Oh, said St. Said Peter, you have to understand how things work here. We have lots of ministers, but you're the first politician we've ever seen. Uh, that, that actually is Ronald Reagan's joke. <laughs> and it's apt today because the challenges we face, specifically those um, uh, around journalism, ethics, and democracy all have roots in the Reagan administration. As I tell my students, you can't understand the present without understanding the past. So I want to go back to the future for a moment. But before I do some words of introduction, my talk is going to address three points. One, the religious disposition of our country. Two, the crisis, the crisis facing the news media, and three, the ethical challenges facing not just journalists, but all citizens. To be clear, I speak as someone who believes we live in a dangerous time. The behavior and policies of the current administration 
in my opinion, threaten not only the health and welfare of all Americans, but also the future of our civil society, our democracy, and the safety of our world. So, I, I, I shouldn't smile, that's not a funny, it's not a smiling moment. So back to, back to Ronald Reagan. When Reagan was elected in 1980, America's international prestige was at a low point. Domestically, inflation was on the rise and many Americans were out of work. Adding insult to injury calls for justice and equality from women's groups, people of color, and gays and lesbians threatened long-standing assumptions of cultural authority. Many whites, especially white men, felt attacked and marginalized. Now, throughout this talk, I'm gonna give you headlines, so we can come back to any points during the Q&A if you want me to follow up on something. Reagan appealed to disaffected white voters by promising to make America great again. Those of you of a certain age can remember that. Those of you who are not quite that old, um, P.S., Trump did not make that one up. Reagan promised jobs, a strong military, and support for policies to end abortion and return prayer to the nation's public schools. Embracing Richard Nixon's Southern strategy, he wooed Southern Democrats, kicking off the 1980 presidential campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi, the site where just 16 years earlier, three civil rights workers were slain by the Ku Klux Klan. Reagan also sought the evangelical vote. Appearing at a convention of religious leaders, he said, you can't endorse me, but I endorse you. Reagan seemed like a strange choice for conservative Christians. He was a former actor and a longtime Angelino. He had been a union leader, a Democrat, and was divorced. Divorced, yes. He belonged to a Christian, conservative Christian church, and he claimed to have had a born-again experience. But the 68-year-old, the oldest man ever to run for president, did not seem like a typical evangelical standard bearer. Yet, as president, Reagan inculcated a religious sensibility that fundamentally changed our national agenda, which brings me back to my starting joke. Reagan told that joke in March 1983 to the National Association of Evangelicals. It was the opening to what has become known as the evil empire speech. That speech affirmed the role of religion in American life and its consequent obligations. Quote, there is sin and evil in the world and we're enjoined by scripture and Lord Jesus to oppose it with all our might. That was Reagan. Opposing evil meant not only ending abortion and reinstitu reinstituting school prayer, it also meant defeating America's great enemy, the Soviet Union. Quote, let us pray for the salvation of all those who live in that totalitarian darkness Pray they will discover the joy of knowing God. But until they do, let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man, and predict the eventual domination of all peoples on earth, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. In the days following, Reagan's geopolitical framing of good and evil would be repeated over and over and over again in the secular and Christian media. His framing became normalized. I want to get back to that issue of framing in the question and answer time because I think um, we have to understand how crucial media is in framing the way we think about issues and the way we look at the world. That evil empire speech was key to a worldview that affirmed the rightness of faith, the wrongness of communism, and the importance of free market and limited government. Reagan believed the US was exceptional because it is God's chosen nation. 
a place where freedom is divinely ordained. That freedom, he believed, should be manifest in the political freedom of democracy, the spiritual freedom of religious liberty, and the economic freedom of free markets and limited government. Even when Reagan did not specifically mention religion or morality in his speeches, he described religious virtues, such as personal responsibility and love of country, that informed his initiatives on tax cuts, ending entitlements, and investing in the strategic defense initiative. In other words, historians debate whether or not Reagan was really religious or whether it was a pose. I'm staying, saying here and now to you that yes, he was a deeply religious man, may not have looked like any kind of Christianity you or I are familiar with, but he held what he felt were deeply religious and Christian convictions, and they informed most of his policies. Reagan helped create a new religious imaginary. By religious imaginary, I mean a collective national sense of what matters and why, and which provides meaning, identity, and purpose for the nation and its citizens. Okay, I know this is my, you know, big university type nut graph here, so I'm going to repeat that. Reagan helped create a new religious imaginary. By religious imaginary, I mean a collective national sense of what matters and why, and which provides meaning, identity, and purpose for the nation and its citizens. In other words, a religious imaginary is not something that you're conscious of that you're going to discuss over the breakfast table on your anniversary with your husband. <laughs> but it's something that, um, that infuses the choices you make about what you do with your life, how you feel about your country, you know, what you decide uh, in far, as far as your job, your relationships. It's a worldview. Reagan helped shift the American religious imaginary, which from Franklin Roosevelt to LBJ had affirmed a welfare state, a multilateral foreign policy, and a religiously neutral public square. That religious imaginary promoted an ethic of the common good, both nationally and globally. The new one emphasized personal responsibility, unilateralism, and a faith-based public square. Okay. I hope everyone's with me. At the same time, an equally momentous shift was occurring in the news media as chains and corporations amassed monopolies. Before Reagan, the feds had blocked media monopolies with regulatory policies that promoted competition and numerous points of view. But Reagan's free market approach ended that. In 1945, 80% of daily newspapers were family owned. 1945, 80% family owned. In 1989, 45 years later, that number had shrunk to 20%. At the same time, in the early 1980s, USA Today and CNN were turning content and delivery norms upside down, just as social media would do 30 years later. Designed for television viewers, USA Today was bright and accessible. Its stories were short, its graphics colorful, and its news contents skewed to infotainment. CNN made news immediate and global. It was the first glimpse of the 24-7 connected world. And even then, in the early 1980s, many media leaders realized computers were just around the corner. No one knew exactly what the impact of the technology would be, but everyone knew it was going to change things. So before I move on, let me recap. Ronald Reagan helped to initiate a fundamental change in the religious and ethical sensibility of the United States. The we are all in this together ethos that had characterized the welfare state, the World War II effort, JFK's New Frontier and LBJ's Great Society was replaced by an individualist ethos. According to this ethos, every person to fulfill their God-given autonomy should be free of constraints. 
specifically an overbearing federal government and unfair market regulations. So let's fast forward 35 years. The Reagan revolution has shifted how many Americans, how many of us think about wealth and social responsibility. But many of the issues that the 40th president hoped to address remain unchanged. Many workers are still unsure of finding steady remunerative full-time employment. Our nation has waged an international war against terror for the last decade, and it has not won us many friends. Likewise, media trends that began in the 1980s continue. Today, six corporations, six corporations own much of the American news media, and the digital Revolution has meanwhile transformed the economy. Networks and daily newspapers no longer set our national agenda. Instead, many of us find information niches that reinforce our opinions. Growing polarization has seemed to split us into two nations. Just last week, BuzzFeed News Analysis reported that more than 180 new partisan news sites launched in 2016. More than 180 new partisan news sites launched in 2016. That's only part of an alternate news universe of some 700 partisan websites and almost 500 partisan web pages, Facebook pages. 700 partisan websites, 500 associated web pages, Facebook pages. According to BuzzFeed, quote, the candidacy and election of Donald Trump has unleashed a golden age of aggressive, divisive political content that reaches a massive amount of people. And I would like to add, as BuzzFeed did as well, is making some people very, very rich. The fake news produced by some of these sites is a big problem. You remember Pizzagate? The story that alleged Democratic operatives used DC pizza joints for human trafficking? Pizzagate is real fake news. But then there's also fake fake news. And, and you know double negatives are a positive, right? <laughs> President, which is President Trump's label for news that he doesn't like or that he disagrees with. It's this conflation of real fake news and fake fake news that has made covering the Trump presidency akin to a trip behind the looking glass, especially since the president himself, who I would argue is a product of this media age, um, since President Trump um, seems to insist on confusing and conflating fake fake news and real fake news. So this is where a discussion of media ethics in the digital age begins, with the recognition that technology, money, politics, and religion have all changed the way that we find and interpret information. Yes, on the one hand, we need to address media ethics, the professional standards that make for exemplary journalism. But those standards arise from deeper ethical commitments that we share as a society. My contention is that the Reagan era shift in the religious imaginary also shifted our ethical commitments. And our current concerns about journalism reflect that dilemma. The Reagan era religious imaginary vaunted freedom. And it also trusted that God would materially reward his followers. Man made in the image of God must be free. And free men, thanks to God's blessing, are rich, powerful, and successful. Sort of a great feedback loop. Is it any wonder that POTUS shield, POTUS as in President of the United States shield, a loosely aligned network of right-wing Christian prayer warriors believe that God anointed Donald Trump to save America and pray daily that he does so. 
or that millions of Americans have no problem with staggering income inequality, xenophobia, the prison industrial complex, and a definition of religious liberty that would deny civil rights based on sexual preference. Or that a Washington Post poll this month found, quote, Christians, especially white evangelical Christians, are much more likely than non-Christians to view poverty as the result of individual failings. Donald Trump is only the embodiment of our current predicament. He lives and dies by the partisan media. He is responsible only to himself. He feels free to break all codes of socially responsible behavior. And he likely would not disagree with those who say that his success bespeaks his blessedness. He is a product of the Reagan era religious imaginary taken to one extreme conclusion. And the nation, the citizens, you and I, all of us, who have accepted tacitly, if not wholeheartedly, this ethos of freedom, of exceptionalism, and of individualism, bear some responsibility for a culture in which Trump could be elected president. <laughs> so this is where we find ourselves today on my anniversary, August 17th, 2017. <laughs> Our national ethos is strongly individualistic. The free market is a dominant good, and God helps those who help themselves. I don't have any quick fixes for journalism or for our country. We did not get into this situation overnight, nor will we change it by tomorrow. The only way it may change is if we, as citizens, news community, news consumers, neighbors, family, and journalists, and that's what makes Jim's work so exciting, decide what makes a good society and how we go from here to there. Maybe that means listening more carefully to politicians. Maybe it means creating a podcast, starting a reading group, creating a Facebook page, volunteering with a group working for change. So let me offer a quick example. A little more than a year ago, Lewis Wallace began working for Marketplace, the public radio show on business and the economy. Wallace covered economic issues in marginalized communities. On January 25th, after reading President Trump's executive orders, Wallace began thinking about what it meant to report fairly in a post-fact environment. He posted his reflections on a personal blog, quote, Many of the journalists who've told the truth in key historical moments have been outliers and members of an opposition. And right now, as norms of a government shift toward a post-fact framework, I'd argue that any journalist invested in factual reporting can no longer remain neutral. Neutrality isn't real. Neutrality is impossible for me, and you should admit that it's impossible for you. Wallace had hoped that his post would spark conversations among his fellow journalists about the problems of reporting objectively that is not taking a side in the Trump era. Instead, it got him fired. Wallace is a transgender person, and his argument was that as someone marginalized in a hostile political environment, it was impossible to remain neutral. But before you dismiss this as an extreme case, consider reporters who are women, people of color, Muslims, Mexicans, Jews, or just not Trump supporters. Can they, should they, be neutral? We live in very interesting times. I never imagined I would see national newspapers call out the president as a liar. That, that just was not something in my journalism career one would ever think to do. I never imagined that the stories I covered in the 1980s about the rise of the religious right betokened more than the upheavals in the Southern Baptist Convention, threats against abortion clinics, and televangelists warning of God's wrath. Yes, those stories were about all that, but so much more. <laughs> 
They were really about the supersession of an ethical standard that honored truth, community, and the dignity of all lives. Is it too much to hope that we can rise to today's challenges and provide our children with better journalism, a revitalized democracy, and a shift in our national religious ethos? I have a daughter just starting college, and I hope that we can. Thank you. So I will come over here and sit on this stool, and this is the test of all Chautauqua speakers. Can you get the microphone out of there? I, if you see, you pass. <laughs> that PhD comes in handy. Yes. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for that, that, that very, um, very well-structured, clear, and provocative speech. And so in uh, um, addition to your other credentials, I wonder, do you have experience in the speech writing business? The reason I ask <laughs> is in the speech writing business, you're told always to tell people what you're, what you're gonna tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them, mm -hmm. as you just very admirably did. So congratulations, I, I, I'm glad to see that. A hand for Diane. And you know, there are many parts of your speech of, with which I completely agree. The structural changes in the news media, the, the shift for uh, the disappearance of family-owned newspapers, a virtual disappearance. What you said about the this sort of elusive grail of neutrality also has been a theme of this entire week's discussion. Jay Rosen led us off on Monday morning talking about how really what reporters can aspire to is not neutrality, but being fair and honest right. about where, where they, they come from. So since I agree with so much in what you said, you said, let me, of course, concentrate on where I might see things differently. And or, or we could go <laughs> drink champagne. That's true. We'll, we'll drink champagne. And we'll, my, my wife and I had our anniversary recently, so we'll have champagne later on and, and Southern Tier beer. I'm going to ask you about one of your premises involving the change since Ronald Reagan. And certainly it is true that if we look back at American history from sort of the Great Depression onward, that was the era of collective national shock, collective national effort in World War II, and then the rebuilding in World War II. But the elements you talk about as the Reagan imaginary, they have their precedence. You know, there's the, the religious part. We've always had religion and politics. We had William Jennings Bryan and Father Coughlin and John Brown and back, back earlier on. The ethic of the self-made person, we had the social Darwinists, so we had Horatio Alger, we had Benjamin Franklin and all that. And the idea of American exceptionalism has been there from the very start. So are you meaning Reagan and his imaginary to be a change from the FDR through LBJ period or really something new on the American scene? Thank you for that question. And obviously, in a, in a talk like this, one can't give one's whole book away. Um, but I think that in order for most states to function, they need to believe in something beyond the material. And what's so interesting about the American exper experiment is we were the first country that had separation of church and state, so we did not have a divine sanction. But in its place, I believe we have always had one kind of religious imaginary or the other. And to me, it's always been a tension between this bent towards individualism and the bent towards collectivism or communitarian, more commun communal sensibility. So what I'm talking about is nothing new in that sense. It's always been flipping and flopping between the two. It's just the most recent iteration. And d does that make you think um, that this is something that can be weighted out as past waves have been weighted out? Are there lessons you take from the past experience of dealing with excesses of this arc of the pendulum? Or what, what does history tell you about the way to deal with this, this wave? Well, historians, like journalists, tend to want to tell a story. And so to tell a story, you have to cut out a lot of the complexity. So it wasn't as if on, you know, what day was Roosevelt elected in 1932? Elected in 32, became president in 33. Yeah. It wasn't inaugurated till what, March or April? Because they had late inaugurations then. So it's not as if on that day in 1933, everything changed. Um, it didn't change. And in fact, the, the seeds for the, the right 
turn that we've taken were being sowed as early as the 1920s. The conservative turn, which has been documented in a lot of new his history books, shows that um, groups of businessmen and clergymen were really busy trying to promote these ideas of free market, limited government from the 1920s on. So even at the height of the Roosevelt era, there were other ideas taking shape. The thing, so nothing is completely one way or the other. Um, it's going to take time to move away from the predominant ethos we have now, but I think it's a matter of people being cognizant of wanting to change. Um, I thought Obama could be a step in this direction, and perhaps he will be. Um, but you need, you need it on lots of levels. You need a president or leader who can strongly enunciate a new vision, you need people on the ground meeting in churches and synagogues and mosques talking about making things different. You need people organizing to, you know, take over local governments as a religious right did throughout the 1980s and 90s. So this is not, and that's what I mean, it's not going to change overnight. There are people who don't believe in the current ethos. And so what we have to do and what I see the resistance, at least in LA doing, is beginning to take a more activist turn to making change happen. I'm going to ask you about something that is not directly in your speech, but it's parallel to it, and we were discussing it earlier before we, we came over. You mentioned that in 1980, when Ronald Reagan won the election, the U.S. was at a low ebb. Uh, as a member of the administration who preceded uh, Ronald Reagan, I, I, <laughs> I, I recall that. Uh, you know, in, in our defense, defense of the Carter administration, this was succeeding the first president ever to have resigned from office, be forced to resign. It was succeeding the end of the Vietnam War and that 10-year uh, tragedy it was during the time of the first ever oil shock. And when there was economic dislocation of kind that makes today's actually seem m mild by comparison, and the mildness by comparison is actually my point. Those of you who are in the amphitheater this morning heard David Von Drele, uh, say that he was impressed by the, the, uh, the conjunction of a very pessimistic national news with what he was seeing as positive developments um, in many places. I think I've given you over the past couple of days my version of that perspective too, which is that national politics are objectively in a very bad situation right now. And there's a national narrative that makes people think that things are bad, every, that any place they don't know about directly, they assume is pre pretty bad too. But my experience with Deb in going to Mississippi and Central Valley, California, and South Dakota, and South Carolina, and rural Maine, is that while there are problems everywhere, in most parts of the country, people feel as if the direction of movement is positive rather than negative. Not every place, not on all issues, opioids are a disaster, Appalachia has unique problems, but generally our experience is that people feel as if at the local and regional level they're getting traction and you know, they're better off than they were a, a couple of, of, of years ago. Um, just one, one more thing to set this up. I was at the Republican convention last year and there was a, a story at the end of the convention. The headline was GOP delegates believe economy is terrible except where they're from. You know, sort of the sense that it must be terrible every place. What do you, and, and you were saying that you thought you had sort of the more pessimistic side of, of, of that divide. Tell me um, how you think media are affecting the view, positive, negative, being, of being the difficult challenge of being aware of where there are problems but well, without being excessively pessimistic. How do you think about this pessimism, optimism balance as you heard David Vondrelli, as you hear me, and as you think of your students? Well, the th what I really dislike about most media is its focus on the negative and the fact that, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. If it's bad news, it's, it's a headline. And I, I, you know, there was that experiment where um, in the early 20th century, Charles Sheldon tried to do the Good News newspaper and, you know, it was a big hit for a few weeks and then nobody wanted to read it, they were all bored. Um, so I, I'm not saying we should only have good news, but I think that 
most mainstream news media don't take seriously the need to report fully. And reporting fully also means reporting on good news and that things are getting better. So to some extent, I believe that the media has, I mean, you and, and David may be lifting this up, which is why I cited you as someone who is working for change in a good way. But and I was grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's rare for um, that to happen. And I know my students who have gone into mainstream media tell me, you know, it's very hard to be allowed to do a story that says something that's not, that's positive. It's not what most, what news, most newspapers or news or television stations want these days. So I think we need that, and I think that's part of thinking about what we want as news consumers. And, you know, maybe it's, these days we can click on things to get the message across that we want to hear more about the positive changes taking place. And it's not Pollyanna, what's going on in the communities you're visiting, it's not all sunshine and roses. People are working very hard to make change and they're struggling against uphill odds. And I think those stories need to be told and they're not being told. Uh, and, and I agree with everything you said, and I think there also is a, a challenge of craft for people in our business, which is there's a sense of greater risk in telling a story that is some way positive because you feel you're worried about being embarrassed if something then goes wrong and if you look like a sucker, as opposed to if you appoint something bad and it gets better, it, there's not the same risk of, of uh, engagement um, or embarrassment. A question for advice you would give to members of this audience and those listening if they by your diagnosis and your prescription as well for how the media should work, and you've talked what news consumers should do, um, what specifically could people in this audience, hearing your description of what's going on, what could they do to help the news be better, to help their local communities be better, to help national politics be better? If you were forced to say, okay, you agree with my, my assessment of what's wrong here, and therefore I can do the following three things, what would they be? Wow, that's such a great question. It's like I could be God for a day. <laughs> um, I would say there's so much to do. As I mean, there is the easiest thing of all, which is just to find news that you think um, is the right kind of news or a good kind of news or an inspirational kind of news and click on it. I mean, you know, I get the Washington Post optimist news um, email letter. Do you know that? It's like their quote unquote good news. And, you know, click on those stories and read them. Or if you read your local paper, you know, let your editor know that you like a certain kind of stories or go in and talk to someone if you're in a small community and say, I want to hear more stories about people who are, um, are cleaning up communities or working against the opioid epidemic or rehabilitating houses or doing something that you think is worthwhile. So being an active news consumer is very important. Also, you know, I know, I don't know how many of you are on new media like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, but, you know, it's really good if you're not to get on there because not only is it a good challenge to mental acuity, but you can start reaching people. So it's like good for you and good for everybody else. So, you know, if you're on Instagram, all you have to do is shoot a picture, snap a picture, put a caption underneath it and send it out to people and say, look, this is a really great thing happening in my community and I want to share it with you. So, or you could post it on Facebook. I think there are so many ways to, to become the change yourself. There's also, you know, finding where you're located, whether it's a community center or a reading group or a church group, and talking to people there about what can we do as a group. So there are many ways to make a difference. And, you know, I've been thinking about that question myself a lot over these last couple of years, and I'll give the 30-second version of, of my, what I've been thinking about, too. At a national and collective level, I think a challenge for all of us now is if our problems are like those that I've said before of the original Gilded Age, looking to solutions that came out of the original populist and progressive age, which mainly means connecting all these local stories of people who are standing up for this or that or engaging in different ways. And also what I would hope every one of you here would do is actually subscribe to publications. You know, the different, you think it doesn't make a difference, but it really does. And that, that's happened in the last couple of months um, too. 
Um, you are in Los Angeles. One of your fields of academic expertise is the industry, uh, the, uh, entertain the entertainment complex. In the Reagan imaginary, as you describe it, even though Ronald Reagan himself is certainly a product of the entertainment in uh, industry, one of the big um, nemeses and demons has been popular entertainment. You know, when, when Michael Gerson was talking about the evangelical, his evangelical movement and why they felt oppressed, they felt as if popular culture was against them and popular culture gave them no, no respect. How do you think the entertainment industry, you know, does it think about its responsibility for the public wheel, for the public welfare? Do you ever talk with them? If you did talk with them, what do you tell them? Well, the, the course you mentioned on media, religion, and Hollywood, I, ca I can't remember the name, but basically I, I look at television narratives, and I, I've done scripted drama, <clears throat> but now I'm moving to reality television, which I don't like very much, but... But we all are moving there, so... Right. Um, what interested me is that for, you know, the, the new move in the country is disaffiliation. And a lot of polls show that although many people are still religious, especially among the young, people are not affiliating. And so one of the questions I ask myself is how do people make meaning? How do they connect to larger virtues? And I think one way they do it is through popular culture and through looking at the narratives that they see around them and trying to discuss them into some sort of sense. sense. And the Game of Thrones, I think, is my favorite example of that nowadays. And it's so incredibly popular because it's a story about power, about sacrifice, about redemption, about... Um, about um, sex. <laughs> hasn't had that much sex in it this year. Um, about... Um, Reincar is it reincarnation when Jon Snow came back from the dead? So, so I mean, all great religious ethical themes are there. And when I hear people talking about them, it's often to sort of make sense of this narrative and what it, what it means. And if you look at the Hebrew Bible, that's what the Hebrew Bible is about. It's about people getting castrated. It's about people like stealing each other's wives. It's about people fighting. I mean, and I believe that those stories, when they were handed down in ancient times, were talked about so people could draw ethical lessons from them. And I think that's what we do with television today if we are intentional about consuming it. And um, I have had a number of uh, a screen uh, showrunners and writers in my class. We've had David Simon, we've had, who did The Wire, we had David Milch, who did. Um, Deadwood, we had Ron Moore who did Battlestar Galactica, we had um, the woman who's doing Madam, is that, who's doing Madam Secretary now, Barbara Hall, and many of these people came from religious backgrounds and they are very conscious of the ethical ideas they put in their shows. David Shore, for example, who did House, comes from an Orthodox Jewish family, and everyone thinks House was about a modern-day Sherlock Holmes. He, Shore says it was about um, asking if an atheist can have morals. Can an atheist act morally? That's what he was looking to show in that, in that series. So while not everyone in Hollywood is thinking about larger issues, I have been surprised at the number of people who are, and who are very conscious about putting messages, if you will, into their shows. A quick last question before I start calling on uh, questions from the audience. You teach students going into journalism. Who is going into journalism now? Who at age 22 says, or 18, I want to be a reporter? So should we feel good or bad? Well, you know, Trump has been very good for us. <laughs> um, there are, there are a lot of people at Annenberg who are going into journalism because they want to be on entertainment t tonight and on ESPN. I can't, I mean, that's one of our strengths. But I have a fair number of people who still want to change the world. They, they care about human rights, they care about international relations, they care about making the world a better place. Um, they are going into journalism because they think that they can make a difference, that they can talk truth to power, that they can afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Their belly is burning, um, and they're there because 
because they believe telling stories is a way to change hearts and minds. Well, that sounds like good news. And on that note, let's begin over here. Thank you for your talk. Uh, no, yes. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. We, we, make, um, uh, we enforce policy with our tax code. And we have enforced the separation of church and state with our tax code by, re by re refusing to allow our religious institutions to take political stands in terms of supporting candidates and so on, or threatening their tax-exempt status with that. Uh, the new media, the new means of communication, the access that everybody has to all kinds of information immediately, uh, in the current administration's uh, mind, uh, has altered the uh, situation enough that we may not need to continue that policy and may be able to allow religious institutions, religious individuals to maintain their tax-exempt status and still promote uh, political parties and political individuals. Uh, how do you feel about that and uh, where is that going? You... So the policy is that, you know, the, the traditional tax Tax, tax penalties or incentives to separate church and state that, that for their tax exemption, religious organizations could not directly participate in politics. Current administration is eroding that line. What do you say? So this is about the Johnson Amendment and, re and I yes. you're talking about the Johnson Amendment and whether or not they should repeal it, right? Uh, no, I think it's a terrible idea. I believe that separation of church and state is extremely important. Um, I... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though. I'm not quite sure why that should be an applause line. It's good that it is. Um, and I, th I, I, I um, saw back in the 80s what churches were doing to endorse candidates when they still had the um, tax problems in front of them. I can't imagine what they would do if they did not have the tax issues in front of them. So I. I feel that um, trying to revoke this amendment is really, really a bad idea. It's another example of Trump paying, playing to his base um, that I hope doesn't come to pass. Thank you. Yes, over here. We'll go side to side for the questions. My question is about are there two kinds of storytelling and is the second kind being taught? One kind is character-driven storytelling, value-based character. You identify with someone. And the other is kind of process, influence, force factor storytelling, which, for example, we train our engineers and scientists and even economists to think that way. There are only 18 people in Congress who majored in science, only one who got a PhD. 90% of the Chinese leadership studied engineering or science. So what is the role of kind of broadening storytelling so people can look, be more analytical? Are you training the next generation to do that? Well, the big word in journalism education now is storytelling. And um, I, I, I don't talk enough to my colleagues to know what that means to them. So a good story can be plot driven, it can be character driven, it can be a little bit of both. I do believe that any st good story, though, does need a certain amount of critical thinking to tell it well and to tease out the most important things because a story that does not have... Could you put the microphone? Yeah. The story does that, that does not have a lesson to it, and that sounds so terribly didactic, but I, I guess I do believe that stories should do good in the world. I mean, stories should have um, a positive influence. So the problem is, is that journalists tend to stay away from value values and norms like good or bad and judgment calls like that. So to say that you want to teach storytelling as a way to do good in society or to think about a better society would be problematic in the least. I think the best I can do subversively is to not pay any attention to anyone else and just do what I want to do <laughs> and teach it. And to just volunteer a bit more on, on your question about the inter interaction of the sciences, you know, The Atlantic now almost 40 years ago published The Soul of a New Machine by Tracy Kidder. And I think we have, I, I do think there is a trend in modern narrative journalism to evolve a lot of the story of science too. Um, I've, done this, I've done that a number of times myself too, and I think it is part of this narrative tradition. Whole separate topic, 
I, I am really, having lived in China for a long time, I'm skeptical of any boasts about the virtue of the Chinese leadership based on their engineering background, but that, that's for another time. <laughs> yes. It's your area. Um, you mentioned what do consumers want covered by the media and how important that is. I'm curious what you think about what do corporations and their investors want covered by the media and how that influences journalism? Uh, that's a great question, and there's um, a micro and a macro level. On one level, corporations want whatever's going to make money for them. So if it's kittens, they want kittens. If it's sex, they want sex. If it's scandal, they want scandal. So in, on one level, um, the bottom line is making money, and so whatever works, works. I think is that negative is what I wonder. Is it negative? Do they want negative because it sells? Well, yes, but I still believe that people would like a little positive with their negative. So I, I know that I enjoy re reading stories about exemplars. It's not like I'd want to read it every day, but if I was you know, reading a story about what's happening in Erie, Pennsylvania, and how people are turning a community around, I think is a good story. So it's not, be it's not saccharine. But I think that's why we have to support that kind of journalism. I think on a more insidious level, the fact that so much of the news media is corporate owned um, restricts what we read and what we don't read. There's a theory in media that um, there are things which are never discussed because they're so outside of what social norms are. So for example, um, Bernie Sanders socialism was not that much talked about in much of the media. If he had run for president, we would have heard a lot more about what it means to be a socialist. But normally, we don't read about socialism because in our American media, that's an idea that's outside the pale. So to, to a very large extent, the problem to me with corporate ownership of the media is that there's an implicit sense of what can be discussed and what can't be discussed and of what's normal and what's not normal. And that's what I meant about norms before. Now, until fairly recently, we did not call presidents liars. And it's interesting that now we do. Um, so I don't, and, and that sort of challenge of the status quo is something that even corporate, corporate leaders realize have to go on. So I think corporate Control of media has two different effects, both of them negative, one, squander, one squashing the possible discourse we can get into, and the other um, rewarding people who want to write about kittens because a lot of people like reading about kittens. And, and if I could just add again a word supporting what Diane says, which I agree with, which is there, there are realms of human activity where there's some tension between purely for-profit operation and the larger so, social effect. Media is one of them, medical care is another, education and religion. So you know, these tensions you're talking about, I think, are just are, are built into that, that situation. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, you know, according to my history class studies of the Great Awakenings, I sort of, you know, saw those also as a, a shift in the religious imaginary of, of the country. But those were shifts that, you know, where religion was about community service and taking care of others. And, you know, the, the evangelicals were the first abolitionists. And so is it the case that this Reagan uh, religious imaginary that you talked about is the first religious imaginary that was about the individual and material wealth and success and, and sort of really blaming poor people for being poor. And if that's the case, you know, we're kind of in new territory. So what can we do and what can the news do to, to pull us out of this if we've never been in this situation before in the context of this pendulum that, that swings from one side to the other? Well, I, I would say that we have been in this situation before because part of what was the dominant social ethos in the late 19th century during the Gilded Age was this idea of the gospel of wealth and this idea that um, you know, individual success and 
the idea that um, God blesses, uh, I mean, Andrew Carnegie, God blesses uh, those who take the initiative. So I don't think that it's new religiously. I think these ideas have always been in competition with each other. Um, and one of the things that happened at the end of the Gilded Age was the progressive era and the work of journalists and the work of church leaders and the work of civic leaders who tried to counter that and say, this has gone too far, there are too many horrible excesses. And so this idea of rampant individualism has to be stopped. You know, it looks different in every age, but I don't think it's totally new. I think it's interesting too, because you know, at the end of the 19th century is when you have the beginnings of um, what we call the prosperity gospel today. And you're familiar with the prosperity gospel, the idea that if, if you tithe then you ask God to love you, you can become really rich and healthy. And um, that idea is, comes from the New Thought School of the late 19th, early 20th century, where you're, you, know, you could control things through the power of your mind. And if you thought a certain way, things would follow. That was sort of taken in by Christians as well, who saw it as a way to um, bring people to church who wanted to improve their lives and believe that they could. I think there's a question on this side. <laughs> right, there was a spider climbing up there. I just wondered if you su could. I wonder if you could What's suggest going on here? as a. I get up in the morning and I read the Times. Usually I go to the editorial page. And then I go to the Washington Post and I read the editorial page. And at the end of that, maybe two hours of reading, I'm ready for a bottle of antidepressants. And. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm going to stop reading that and take a break. But I went back in three days and was reading it. You know, what do we do? I mean, where do we, do we just look for good news stories? And then I thought, okay, I'll give the Times a chance. And they have this column now, what the right and the left is writing. Well, I went to it and when I opened it up yesterday for the first time, there was Bill O'Reilly. Now, I'm not going to read Bill O'Reilly in the New York Times. So where do we, what do we read? What, where do we go? There's always America's oldest magazine, and now it's most popular magazine website. <laughs> um, I realize now I should put in a plug for my own publication, which I haven't done. Yes. Um, I am the publisher of something called Religion Dispatches. And if you've seen Religion Dispatches, it's a place where we, we take seriously religion, politics, arts, and culture. And it's an alternative, alternate site for the news. So it's not necessarily happy, happy news at Religion Dispatches, but it could be news that offers a different way of thinking about things or puts you in touch with people who might be thinking similarly to you. Um, I, I agree with you. It's hard to read the news these days without getting overly depressed, but I find myself reaching out to more and more news sites to see what they're doing with this. And I've been really struck by what's possible to read at BuzzFeed or um, Vice or The Atlantic, because it's interesting to see how different news organizations are taking on the challenge of reporting the Trump administration. Have you looked at The Onion? That might be a good counter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, over here. Uh, yes, uh, you uh, associate individualism and um, with with Reagan and cons and conservatives and suggest that that works against the common good and um, others would associate. Uh, notions of personal freedom and autonomy, uh, self-determination, right to privacy, uh, those kind of issues um, with, uh, with individualism and, and with, I guess you could say, the cultural left. Um, and how do those latter values, how, how do they promote the common good? That's a very good point, and it goes to the um, it goes to the reality that anything you say, you could say the exact opposite and make a good case for it. It's true that individualism, in and of itself, is not a bad thing, and it's true that it was very much vaunted by the left in the '60s, and you could make a very good case for 
for how much of our current predicament has to do with the countercultural move of the 60s and some of the um, ideas such as individualism and you know effective emotionalism and therapeutic culture that were promoted then. The problem with any of this is when you have too much of it. And I think the problem with what Reagan did was individualism is not necessarily bad. Personal responsibility is not necessarily bad. It's to the extent that he pushed it and the fact that he promoted it in the context of, in my opinion, limited government and free markets. Because I think that was where it went awry. So Reagan wanted tax cuts because, I mean, he believed in limiting government, but he also believed that entitlements should end because personal responsibility would, would for, should force people to take seriously their ownership of their lives. That's good in theory, but a lot of people cannot do that. And I think Reagan and some conservatives have a problem realizing that there are many, there are people among us who cannot live under that kind of rigorous individual personalist ethos. So we have four minutes left. You know what's about to happen. We're going to have the people who are already standing up here each ask your question back to back, and then Diane will answer as many. You'll answer them all together. This is this is the lightning round with which we traditionally end things here in the Hall of Philosophy. Yes, sir. Yeah. You, so we'll do four uh, four people here, four questions. Yes. The ultra wealthy have um, a lobbyist in, in Washington D.C. to uh, move their um, agenda. Uh, is there a similar mechanism that is used for traditional uh, uh, journalism where they try to influence it? And are we becoming more a nation of sheep than we once were? So I'll write these down to remind you. Yes, lobbies for the ultra-rich. Should there be some on the other side for journalists? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, where, uh, good presentation. Uh, and uh, where is America's environmental protection going? as a matter of long-term public health and protection of the planet. Good. Environmental, yes. Yes, ma'am. Protection Hi. of the planet. Yes. Uh, it seems like there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of Trump's base, and probably also many on the left also, totally distrust all mainstream news organizations categorically. And it seems like that's, at least the extent of it, is a recent thing. Is that something that, in your experience, organizations are grappling with? And is there anything they're trying to do to reclaim those folks? Or are they totally a lost cause? Great. Thank you. And you're last. <laughs> so just in the term, in the leftist term, woke, you know, you're woke to this, woke to that. How much of current secular leftism is itself a, spirit, a spiritualist movement, basically worshiping some kind of, you know, untenable dogma or another? Whereas, like, even mentioning a certain word literally rec recalls the scene in Life of Brian where the guy is trying to say Jehovah and everyone wants to stone him, like, on, on and on and on. So to remind you of the four themes you have to deal with in the next now two minutes, it's whether there can be lobbies for journalism, for, you know, this kind of right kind of public knowledge, state of envi the environment, <laughs> but it's essentially how it connects to journalism, um, whether news organizations are dealing with this from both right and left mistrust of what they're doing, and whether there's a spiritual, whether leftism in particular has a spiritual element right now. <laughs> you can choose any, any subset. I'll write more clearly. Yeah. <laughs> Lobbyist, environment, both sides, woke. <laughs> uh, I, I happen to believe that everybody has a spiritual component because everybody gets out of bed in the morning and we couldn't get out of bed in the morning if we didn't believe in something beyond ourselves. So whether it's left or right, Christian, Jew, disaffiliated, we need to believe in something. And if we don't, then that in itself is a big problem. Um, it's interesting too, because I think that some of the most interesting religion I see in spirituality is around the environmental movement and the echo spirituality, echo feminism, um, to me, which, which sees environmentalism as a spiritual religious problem is, is deeply moving and we need to see more journalism about that. I think, you know, it's interesting to me that journalists do not take social movements seriously. 
in the wake of Charlottesville, we saw a lot of reporting. We don't see that much reporting around things like Occupy until two weeks in. I think the coverage of Black Lives Matter was terrible. It's still depicted as sort of a, you know, radical race movement where there's so much more to that particular, um, that particular um, group of people. So in a way, getting a lobbyist for people who are proactively social active on the left or, I hate to say the left, on the progressive or on the human oriented side of things <laughs> would be good. And I don't know why, I, I haven't been in mainstream newspapers or outlets enough to know why they are so slow on picking up social movements that are not based in hatred or, um, or anger. Um, you know, they did better with the Women's March, but I think that was because it was against Trump. I'd be curious to see in the future if um, poor people or people of color or marginalized people um, want to organize how much newspapers will cover that. I, I think, again, it's part of this, what do we cover and why do we cover it? And you, you've very deftly done three of them. The only remaining one is, are mainstream organizations aware they're being uh, suspect from both sides, both the right and the left, or is that something they're grappling with? Well, I believe that they do yeah. know it, and they are trying to do everything possible to appeal to everybody, yeah. and, you know, they're still thinking about how do we make money, and so far it looks like you make more money by baiting people yeah. and, um, and bringing hate to the fore instead of more positive, constructive emotions. But um, I never thought I'd see the media in such a um, anti-government stance. Mm. It's, it's shocking to me. Um, but then again, I guess if I was part of the alt-right, I would say <laughs> that I, my, my eyes are finally clear. <laughs> So I think that Professor Winston has done a marvelous job, both in the prepared and the unprepared part of the session. Thank you. Well done. So we thank uh, James Fallows and Diane Winston for their wisdom and demonstrated expertise. And we ask you to come back tomorrow to hear uh, the final conversation of the week between Jim Fallows and Wajahat Ali. Please come. We'll see you tomorrow.